And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. Today's guest is Jeff Tolley. Jeff had a near-death experience where he encountered three spirit guides, and today we're going to learn about it. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Um, it's, it's a pleasure being on your show, so thank you for having me. It's the Jeff and Jeff show today. It sure is, <laughs> eh? Jeff with a J? Jeff with a J, right? There you go. If you don't mind, can we start on the day that your NDE happened and go from there? Yeah, sure. So... July 17th, 2010 will be a day that I never forget. And actually that day is coming up. So yeah, I'll never forget that day. It was just close to 10 years ago or 11 years ago now. And that was a day where I had decided to end my life for various reasons. Um, The way my life was going was just not good. I had more pain than I ever wanted to admit I had. And things were just not right. And I was ready to depart. Um, So I was also, um, I struggled with drug addiction. And so I went that road of taking an entire bottle of of narcotic painkillers. And once I did so, it was about five minutes later, everything started to go very black. And I remember so vividly the peace. It was this peace that I had in that darkness. And then the darkness began to fade away. And the next thing I remember is floating above my body and watching paramedics like work over top of me. And it's funny because the first thing I really kind of like was conscious of or aware of was, wow, like this is what it's like to to be dead. Because I never had a real belief around that. I did maybe have certain ideas of what it could be like. One of those ideas was something about like maybe going to hell just because of the the life that I did live. But it was very clear to me that being there, all the pain, all the negativity, all the shame and all the guilt was no longer with me. It was in my body. And so just processing this experience was incredibly weird to say the least. And I was still a little confused. So there was no clarity. I was more or less confused about the whole thing. Um, so that was another thing that was just odd. I was trying to gain like a thought process about it all because I felt like my thoughts were slipping away at the same time I was trying to figure out what was happening. And then it was all of a sudden I started to feel and more or less get more or less get a um, um, a view of my of my life leading up to that point. All the things that I did that were say negative or how I affected people negatively and positively. I felt the anger they had towards me, but I also felt, you know, the good I did, like the feelings of, of, of relief that when I did help people. So I started to notice that everything was joined in, everything connected. It was very clear that there was no separation from anyone that I interacted with. It was all meshed in together. And I got to feel and review. So we hear a lot of times about life reviews. And that's exactly what happened. There was more or less a review, but it was more of an emotional review of how I affected others emotionally. And um, after this, things started to open up even more. And I started to see beyond this life. So this life review, but I started to see other life views as far as like the past life, the one just before this. And then as I started to kind of review those other ones started to open and then it just kept going. And so, but it was funny cause we're not, I wasn't in time or space. It was very clear that time and space was a more of a process. So everything is incredibly slowed down and now everything's r- running at a rate that's so fast that past lives, like multiple past lives are meshed all in one kind of a moment. And then it just kept opening up. So the longer I was out of my body, the more this opened up and it was very like, it just kept going. So it was very apparent that, you know, we talk about like old souls or new souls or things like this. I could, I could liken it to a time frame of probably trillion years worth of lifetimes. It just kept opening and opening. And the time of it, if you were to go linearly, I believe that we all kind of are old souls 
but we only have so much access to those, like to those experiences. Like, you know how um, children, like a three-year-old will become all of a sudden like a savant and he'll be like this amazing piano player, right? That's because they're actually accessing these past lives where he already was a piano player. And like, it was apparent, like these things were becoming made, like they were being realized for me. So at the same time that I was experiencing this near death experience, it was also teaching me about life, about energy, about reality. Also like it was showing me about the mistakes that I had made, my purpose, even other people's purposes that I interacted with. Um, it was just showing this much broader, broader point of view. And um, from where I came from, like having, you know, the negativity and the drugs and stuff, just it was very clear that I lived my life incredibly wrong. Like I set up this, this blueprint for myself to follow and every challenge that I had laid out, I failed every single one. And it was so clear to see that it was just obvious that every single one I failed, which ultimately led to the, to that death. Right. And um, I got to see this. It was like a grid, a blueprint of my life that was laid out and that I built that blueprint. I built the challenges. I put in certain people, certain friends, my family, my parents, and I laid out all these little kind of tests and trials and tribulations. And um, when I was looking down on it, I was feeling like, oh, like I couldn't even get one right, you know, like not one thing that I get out of this. It was like, I, I, I didn't feel horrible because when you're in that state, you can't feel bad, but you kind of, it was kind of like, ah, oh, man, like that was, you know, I got, I, now I got to do this over again. So these challenges that I set up, the soul, my soul wanted to go through these. It wanted to transcend some fears and, and things like that. Um, so the next thing that I remember is my younger brother who had died the year previous he had come up to me, gave me a hug, and he had said, wow, that was quite the ride. It looks like you didn't even get one thing right. That kind of became like almost a joke um, and saying, you know, do you want to go back um, to try it again to actually, you know, work through these challenges? You don't have to, but you can. And, and then he said, I want you to come and follow me because I want you to meet someone special. So I had gone down this you could say a hallway. It, it was, it, we, we weren't where we were anymore, where the pet, like the paramedics were there. I was no longer in that area. I was gone somewhere else. And he brought me into this room that was just, it was like basically a round room and it was just all light. There was nothing but light. There was no floor, no walls, really no ceiling, but it was, it, it appeared to be round. And I was there and then my brother had kind of somehow opened up a door in this white room and we walked in and there was these three beings there, called them spirit guides. And they had looked at me and said, you know, you're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. And we would like and advise you to go back. We know that you wanted to leave, but we really advise that you go back. So it wasn't like they were forcing me. They made me make the choice and just said, we urge you because there's a life that you need to live. There's a life that something that you have to do that's more than what you just did. And um, so I decided, yes, I mean, it was very easy for me to decide yes, because it was very obvious with this knowledge going back, I probably have a better chance now. I mean, especially if I would remember it. I didn't know if I would remember any of this when I went back. Um, however, I did. But so when, when we were there, this holographic image um, started to appear and just started to go around me in this round room and started to surround me. And it was an image of my future. It was an image of what could be if I went back and if I were to fix um, the, the problems if I were to go through the fears and the challenges, if I were to work my stuff out. Also, there was a karmic restribution. Like I had to pay off a karmic debt, which is something I always question whether karma was real. And yes, absolutely. I had to feel what I did to others. And that was a way for me to learn, not like a punishment, but I had to learn that 
if I do learn that, I'm, I'm more chances of me of doing that to someone else is not going to happen because I actually felt what they would feel. So karma for me was a, yeah, it was more of a tool for my growth. And um, so while I was in this room seeing this future, um, my brother was there. And just the way that the way that I that I felt um, I, it's kind of unexplainable, but the level of peace, the level of connection, it was so, and it was very obvious that I was a part of what I felt. So in my opinion, like in my experience, I didn't, I didn't get the sense that there was God that was in a sense separate from me. I felt that I was one with all that is, which we've been kind of calling God. And so everything felt one and I felt one with it. And it gave me this sense of absolute relief. So when I did go back into my body, all that pain and shame and guilt and, and drug withdrawal and all that stuff that was still there came right back in. I felt right back into that. Right. And now I knew, Oh man, I have to like, I have to redo this. Um, so going from feeling like that to feeling what I did was such an adjustment. It took me months just to adjust to the pain again and to just the mental anguish. But I had brought back this knowledge and I started to use these principles as far as like how energy was working and how I can take advantage of just the state that I was in that were very kind of slow down, but I could speed that up by not being so heavy, by not being so negative. And it really helped with my life afterwards. And then I was able to really transform because I knew the challenges because I was outside. So I got to keep everything when I came back. So I got my challenges. I knew everything that I did wrong and all that I had to do. So it was kind of like I got a cheat sheet or something, you know, about life when I came back. I also got to see my future. So I knew exactly where I was heading if I just continued on this road and you know, the road, not like the road was easy. It was incredibly hard, but at least I knew what I had to do. And I was given um, a glimpse into what I'm here to do as well. I feel very like blessed and lucky about being able to see that um, just because I know it just gives me, you know, a reassurance that what I've done and all the work I've done actually is going to amount to something. So that was, um, that's really good. Another thing I want to mention too that was really interesting to me is that when we're setting up, at least for me, and I'm not saying that we're all doing this, this is just my opinion, but when we're setting up um, our blueprint for life before we come in, what we do is we put this veil over us. Like we almost go in a state of amnesia and we go down into our life without the knowledge of these past lives. And we have many of them. And in those past lives, we have so many skills and so many things that we learned that if we had all those things, life would be too easy, right? So we actually set up our lives to be difficult, uh, to be very challenging. Like we want that. The soul actually is desperate for these challenges, at least mine was. And the more we, we challenge ourselves, you know, the harder it is for us, the more the soul will actually expand. And I believe that's the main goal of our souls is to really ultimately expand and being here in this very dense 3D earth is the greatest place to do that because of all the various emotions and pains that we feel. And so I kind of like the analogy I use for this is actually when, when I was in spirit, it was like I was in a, in a form of steam and being in physical, it's like now I'm now ice, you know? And, but we can change that ice to more of a water state by actually just removing a lot of the heavy beliefs we may have, or, you know, the, the, the emotional energy that we carry on through trauma and things like this. And we can change that state and loosen it up a little bit. So we're not so dense and heavy. I was incredibly heavy just because of how everything, everything negative, right. Plus not only the toxins of, of the drugs in my body and emotionally, I was so heavy. You, you, you know, you can see these people, you can kind of see it in their eyes. They just have this aura of heaviness, right? You can sometimes see it or whatever. And other people, you can just feel the lightness. They're kind of uplifting when you're around them. 
that's you know that's something that I kind I I notice a lot. But since I've come back, my um, my psychic abilities have been incredibly enhanced. Um, many things I can see things I never could see before. Um, seeing spirits, I always had this spiritual. I always had the ability to kind of see spirits, but not like the way I do now. Not as just seeing them walking around everywhere and and being able, able to interact with them. So this experience changed me in so many ways from being this one person and then doing a complete 180 to this other person. So that's kind of, I think pretty much what all I can remember um, around that. Do you have any questions, Jeff? Uh, yeah. First, I want to say thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah. Do you think you can remember some of your past lives and give us some examples? I can. Yes. So the previous one, I was in Japan, I think it, it felt like very Japanese to me. And my father and my mother were both murdered in front of me. And I had, I grew up with a friend of the family and the friend had brought me into a kind of a government organization where I was doing more, um, I say, what's the word for it? Like, like being a spy to some degree. Hmm. I would be sent to other countries and kind of spy and, and then come back with what's going on. That was like my very previous one. I had one where I was a, a knight, of course, in the, in the 1600s, where I was just, there was a very wooden, it was kind of a wooden, I don't know, like a wooden hut. It wasn't a hut, but kind of a wooden castle, if you will, they have. And I was kind of the, um, I don't know, like, I say the owner, like an owner of it, I was maybe like a protector of this place. And so there, there was that. I didn't get too much of that. I've had various. Um, the what I what I really noticed when it when it when it came back was all the different races, all the different you know, women, men, like from jumping back and forth from being male to female, male to female. Another thing about this too is um, they go back even into extraterrestrial life forms as well, and even animals. So one, I was a, a gorilla. I saw one where I was a panther. I saw one where I was a frog. I saw one where I was another, just like a spider monkey. Um, and then the ET ones were all were very weird as well. And they all kind of blended in, but they never really hyper-focused. When I saw it, it was more of a blending of all of them that kept opening up. Did you happen to notice that you had some type of ability like as if you were a musician or you were a carpenter or whatever that you could say oh yeah I remember being that let me see if I can do that now in this life I never got any real skill like that except for one and that was a kind of a martial a war a fighter hmm. the fighting thing stood out in more than one life form so yeah like with when it when it coming to like war there was a lot of war shooting guns as, as one, but also wielding swords. There was even in tribal where there was um, spears being being thrown. But a lot of what I saw was highlighted in the more tactical position. Yeah, maybe you've been a warrior through many lives. Yeah. I think that's and that's kind of a light. That's kind of life I have now, except it's not violent. It's more a warrior in my own for my own life, you know, right. I believe you still remember your life's purpose. Can you share it with us? Yes. So this purpose, the purpose of my life this time is obviously to go from a very dark um, life and transcend it to something um, into more light. And as far as my future goes, there is a lot of big plans. Do you want me to get into some of the holographics that I've seen? Sure. I can show you some, like tell you some of like what I saw for my future. Um, there was a castle. There was a very interesting um, looking cars that were seemed very futuristic, hard to explain though. Um, and I was teaching, but there was also something that had to do with um, government and implementing new structures for the future as far as governmental structures or something that has to do with passing on information as far as the world stage or doing something with policy as well. I'm wondering if that was just showing you what's going to happen in this life or multiple lives in the future. 
it could extend out. Yeah. Like the future thing showed me one thing too. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for the questions. Cause like, you know, I only remember so much, mm-hmm. but um, it was, it was very obvious. And one thing that really kind of confused me was the future is incredibly different and not too far from now. Mm-hmm. So it didn't seem like, it seems like we go through something major that completely alters everyone and the way we, we deal with so many things. So um, whether that be, you know, aliens coming down or something like that, that probably is going to have a big effect, but the future does shift radically in a very short time. Cause it didn't make sense to me. What? Like that's a future that seems like way, way out. And I don't look too old in this hologram for that to even be real to me. So when you made out all these plans and, and challenges for your life, we do that before we're born. Is that correct? We do that before we're born? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you had planned out all this stuff. And then in your life review, you got to see whether you pass or failed, I guess. More or less. And there's no judge, right? We're, we're our own judge, prosecutor, jury, you know, like of our own lives. There's no one judging us. We judge ourselves. We decide, you know, what was what and where we went right and where we went wrong. And it's it's pretty easy to see too. It's not like, well, maybe I, I went right there. No, it's pretty obvious that, you know, I fail. Right. Now your brother took you in a room that was full of light and I believe the three guides were there. Do you feel like you knew those three guides? Like maybe they were part of your soul group or were they beings that you had never met before? No, I knew these and they came from past. I would say they were part of a soul, a family soul group. Hmm. They were very, it was very, we knew each other. It was very obvious that we had a lot of time together and that we had a very deep connection to each other. Did they look like beings of light or did they look more human in form like we do now? They looked more human in form. Hmm. Yeah. So there was, there was two girls and one guy. One guy was like an old kind of tribal guy. And the two women seemed like they came from the Victorian era wearing those types of clothes. So yeah, I still kind of confuses me to why they showed up like that. I don't know, but that's, that's what they were. What changes have you made in your life to make yourself lighter? Whoa, I, everything. Hmm. Um, so I quit using drugs. Of course I quit smoking and drinking and all that stuff. I, I, I changed my diet and I did an investigation into my mind over what was true and what wasn't what I believed about the world and myself were pretty much mostly false when I really looked into it um, and just as much about the world as myself. So I had these beliefs about myself that were, you know, you're not worthy. You're not important. You mean nothing. You're a loser. You know, just beliefs that I built up from being a child and they just kind of carried on. So I had to change all those to really match my value. And then some of the hardest work for me was the emotional work. I had to release a lot of emotions that were built up. And there was a period of about three years where I cried myself to sleep and cried waking up. I just couldn't stop crying. Um, and also there was there was bouts of extreme anger and letting go through like screaming and just like, oh man, I, I, I remember it got so bad that my face turned black as I was screaming. I also too got to a point where I was vomiting But at the same time that I was puking, I was seeing visions of the TV, like programming of the news and stuff were flashing up. And I got to, it was like I was vomiting, but at the same time I was vomiting mental stuff as well. Hmm. It was really, what I went through was incredibly extreme. Um, I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. Did you just work it out on your own or did you have any like professional help? No, I did not go to any professional help because I knew that they would not take to what I was doing and what I was believing and what I was seeing and what happened to me. I had to uh, work it out on my own and that took me 10 years. And yeah, I would say that for eight of those years, I was incredibly ungrounded and just not right. The abilities you have from this experience, 
Do you use them all the time or do things just kind of come and go for you? Yeah, they've some bit have been incorporated into my now day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. Something that was very tough for me to learn was how to shut it off and on, especially with the spirits. They would constantly come to me and bombard me. And I just didn't know how to deal with them. But I was able to then learn how to be able to click that off, turn it on. I can still see them walking behind or beside you know, um, their loved ones. I can see them going all over the place, but they don't bother me like they used to. Um, and you know, so yeah, that was just incredibly difficult and not just the, the mediums of seeing spirits. It was also the clairvoyance. I would get visions of the future visions of the past. I mean, I would be walking and hearing and seeing thousands of years. I believe in the future. I saw like floating cities and all kinds of stuff. And I've seen in the past, very ancient stuff, but it just got to the point where it just overwhelmed me. And I just wasn't, you know, I just wasn't right. And I didn't know what to do with it. But over the years, I learned to be able to turn it off and turn it back on. I really um, integrated all of this stuff. And there's so much more too. And we probably go on for a day on here about all the things that happened and then the things that I had to learn to integrate or learn to accept that it was difficult um, with that, but I, I managed. Can you tell me about the very first time that you started seeing other beings here on earth and how did you react? So the first time I was actually little, I saw my grandmother. She was floating above my bed late at night. That was the first time. And I didn't necessarily react in any real way. I mean, I told my parents, um, they didn't believe me. Um, they just thought that I was making things up or, or they just, or they said I was dreaming. It was just a dream or whatever, but it absolutely wasn't. And then, um, that happened a lot when I was a kid where I would see things, but I just, I knew, I guess I knew better or something to, to say anything after my parents didn't believe me. I just kind of learned right there, maybe to not talk too much. I knew that when I was little, something was different with me. It was very obvious that I was a different kid. Um, I would always view people from this point of view that I learned later on others didn't have. And things would happen to me, like I would be pushed, I'd feel my arm, my shoulder getting pushed. I've had other experiences where I would feel physical things, but no one was there. Um, all kinds of stuff would move and things like that. Um, and some, you know, I just didn't really, I couldn't make sense of it when I was young. But it wasn't until I was older that that started to come together for me. Have you had any other out-of-body experiences? Yes. Um, I'm able to, I guess you can say, um, astral travel. Um, so that's something that I can do. I'm able, now that I've been able to kind of pull myself out, I can do it at random. I can do it at will. So, I, But I have to go into a meditation. I can sit, meditate, and I can pop out, and I can go and yeah, astro travel and go places and explore. I do it a lot while I'm dreaming, especially like when I'm, when I go to bed at night, I'm constantly coming and going. Have you ever tested yourself? Like had somebody write something down in a room and say, okay, I'm going to pop out and go see it and see if, it's, if I'm really, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've tested it. Yeah. Oh, really? That's awesome. I had them write a note and put it in a book on a certain page on a big bookshelf. Mm -hmm. And then I, I was upstairs and they were downstairs and then I tested it because I wanted to see too, like, it's what, you know, and yeah, it absolutely went right to the book, right to the page. I was floored as much as the, you know my friend was really at that time. You'd mentioned something about having a Kundalini experience. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So my Kundalini experience happened after the near-death experience. And this was a very special um, event for sure. This is something that I will never forget. I will never, it's just, it's something so unique. So this happened with an ex-girlfriend of mine and it happened through a black and I automatically felt, you know, my, my root chakra. I just felt an energy spinning like incredibly fast. And there was so much pleasure surrounding that something I've never experienced such level of pleasure before it ever, not even close. And that spinning had just begun to kind of move up my spine. Um, it wasn't automatic. It took a long time to get up. 
But about, about three months later, probably, it started to push its way up. And I would go through other centers of the body. And it would kind of force upon me like a challenge. It would force upon me some sort of thing that I had to mature from or integrate. So there was always big challenges that would come as it would move up. Then it would force another reality challenge, another um, form of maturity. And that's how I can say it was like it was healing me and growing me. And I had to either I had to either get the message. I had to get the maturity from it. I had to get the healing around what the issue was before it could move up more. And as I continued to go up and up and up, um, eventually it finally got to um, the head and it, oh my God, it blew my belief systems wide open. So it entered the brain and I, you can feel every, you can feel where it is the whole way. And I knew that when it entered my head, I knew that something was probably, I, don't, I didn't know what to expect. I just knew that this was going to be probably challenging. And yeah, so all of my belief systems came basically into question, but they already were into question. It more or less burped them out of me and more or less pushed them all up, brought all of my subconscious beliefs came to the surface for me to look at and then discard. But this is too where the um, the vomiting, right? The vomiting and seeing these projections of the media and programming and images and memories of my childhood, these were coming out of me through um, just visions, just, just, you know, visions. Yeah, is the best way to kind of put it. Hmm. And so the Kundalini, yeah. And since then I learned a lot about Kundalini after, because I wanted to know what was happening with me. And I did a lot of research on it. And then I found out, you know, this is kind of what happens. Um, I guess for what people think, um, I, I haven't really come across too many that have had like a full blown Kundalini awakening. Um, but there's a lot of good information out there on, on, about the process, but it was, it was something that I would never wish upon someone. They talk about your third eye, right. Opening. And that's, was a part of this whole thing where the pineal gland was activated. And this is where the visions of and the clairvoyance just went on supercharge. And so now it's, it's, I'm seeing into parallel versions of reality, parallel versions of myself. I'm seeing future timelines, but different ones. Um, I'm seeing all kinds of stuff, man. And, and it's, it's constantly there. It's like I'm on a mushroom trip that lasted years, years, and it just won't end, right? It just kept getting more and more extreme and then it kind of peaked out and then it kind of died down a little bit but that took years so going through all this stuff with the nde and the kundalini and some other things it all happened at once and the hardest thing for me was to accept it all and try to work through it um i'm someone who kind of like i in some ways i wish some of this stuff didn't happen, but in other ways, I'm blessed. It was a double-edged sword. Um, it's, I'm grateful for all these things that I had experienced. But man, the level of pain and suffering and hell and sacrifice mm -hmm. for it, I still even believe today wasn't worth it. It was just too hard. My experience in the last 10 years, it, is, it was horrible. It was so bad. It had to push everything out and you know, it wasn't easy. I'm going to jump back to your NDE and your past lives. And you mentioned ETs. Did you see yourself as an ET like on another planet or something? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Various different ETs. Um, one that I saw that was more prevalent was one that was more like would look like a salamander. Hmm. And the energy was very blue. And um, it was very, the environment was incredibly what you would think of a swamp, but more of a blue tinged swamp. And yeah, like a standing kind of salamander, reptoid kind of um, thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was other ones too, like I saw reflections of humanoid. So they did kind of look human, but they definitely had an aspect that wasn't. And there was one that was beyond different. It was like a ball of goo that could transform and shift into whatever it saw 
that way it was around. Um, so those are kind of specific ones and they just blend, right? They, they will blend out and they become, it was just obvious. There was so many more. It's just, those are, will be more specific than I, that I, I got for you. What do you think inspires you about your experience? Um, well, you know what, this experience that I had changed me. It completely altered me from being, from being, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to put this term on me, but like I was a complete loser back then. I was someone who wasn't, I wasn't a good person. I was mean. I was selfish. I, I just, I wasn't who I was today. So yeah, this experience changed me and altered me into, you know what, who I was when I was a very young kid. When I was a young kid, I had such compassion and such good qualities about me. I had, I just, you know, my parents were always so mad because they knew the young me, but then I changed into this horrible person. Now I know that I know like this horrible person was created because of abuse and trauma, but I'm not, you know, I'm not labeled. I'm not blaming myself for that, but the abuse, the level of abuse and the trauma and all these things that happened to me, it just made me a version of myself that even I don't, I didn't like, um, but I didn't know how to change out of that. Right. It just, it just got worse and worse and worse. Do you have any life lessons that you can share with us, you know, for everybody to improve their lives? Yeah. I think the one thing that I would say is if we look at our life, like it's a game to be played, to be won instead of, live to be successful in we will have a much better time at conquering you know our fears and overcoming challenges if we look at our life like it's a adventure right instead of just a repeat have to do but your day is an adventure what am i going to learn today i can't wait for this challenge so i can finally defeat it and when you do defeat challenge you grow you will actually grow as a person so you can feel these growths and you can kind of look at yeah like a video game like every time you have a challenge it's like collecting little gems and then you get to move to the next level and that's the way I live my life like there's always the next level if I pass this test and I can feel honestly I feel the growth and the healing every time I do it so I'm always looking forward for tomorrow even though you know things might not be the best I still always want to put a positive slant on no matter what happens, because if I do that, I will get a positive result from it, no matter what it looks like. And ultimately we decide um, what our, we decide what life is. We put the meaning on whatever happens to us. Life does not have an inherent meaning attached to it. We get to decide the meaning for us. We get to decide the meaning of anything that occurs. So we have all the power to decide everything we do and anywhere we go. So it's almost like just jumping into a game and just whatever you want to get out of it, it's up to you. But you forgot, yeah. but you forgot you're in the game. Yeah. You got to wake up to know that you're first playing the game mm -hmm. and then start playing it. Um, and when you start playing in the game, life becomes more joyful. So are you saying that we're not supposed to be here struggling, even though we're supposed to um, overcome challenges, we're not supposed to struggle. We're supposed to be happy. And no, 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 no. Like we're supposed to struggle. Yeah. Struggle is a part of it. Resistance is a part of the game, right? Um, you know, when we go to the gym resistance by pushing heavy weight is what creates the strength of our muscles. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in life. The resistance that we get from life itself when we finally overcome it, we will become stronger to take on the next next task. Now, life is not all about being positive, but there's a balance. And we just have to learn to manage what we have and try to be as positive as we can towards that. So that, like I said, you can extract something positive from it. All right. Besides seeing beings and being clairvoyant, are there any other negative aspects of this experience that you have to deal with? Oh man. Yeah. Well, the negative about all of what I went through was having to learn what it was, what it meant, having to integrate all this without the help from someone else. Um, having to be one, 
out of millions that don't wouldn't agree with the way I think. Um, so loneliness, separation is a big part of my life. Um, I don't see eye to eye with virtually anyone I meet. So I'm always kind of having to alter myself to be around others and bring myself to their level and like gain where they are so that I can match them instead of being too much like myself. Because the moment I be too much like myself, that's when the rejection happens. And I mean, I'm okay with, you know, bringing that down a bit just so that I can have some social life. Mm -hmm. I tried being fully me. It, it doesn't work. I mean, unless I'm around people who are very open like yourself, Jeff, then I'm sure it would work. But for the people that I'm around and stuff, no, I just got to keep to myself and, and just try to fit in the best I can. Yeah, I'm kind of glad you went there because I was going to ask, how did your friends and family handle this when you told them your experience and the new changes that you're showing? So, no, not well. Mm -hmm. uh, my family, well, I don't communicate with my family anymore. And my friends that were once my friends aren't my friends anymore. So this changed everything for me and put me on a whole new road towards new people and new things. My family pretty much is just, um, I love my family and all, and I have compassion for where they are, but they think that I'm completely gone insane. Mm -hmm. And I can't be around people that think I'm literally mentally ill and think I should go on pills and see doctors when I don't need to. Mm -hmm. I'm totally fine. I just, I don't need to be around that. So I cut ties with that until they can learn a little bit more about what it is I am, I guess. If you don't mind me asking personal questions, I'm assuming you're a single guy. And if so, yes. how is it, how does that all work out when you meet new girls? I mean, how do they <laughs> handle this when they find out the deeper layers to Jeff? Um, well, <sighs> I've been single for quite a while, um, but I do have, I do have my best friend is female mm -hmm. and she is very open to this. She's been a great support and um, she's someone that I love dearly. Um, so there is very few people that I, that I will talk to about this when it comes to dating, I'm getting better at just being me. And what I will do is I will slowly drip who I am to her and gauge her reaction. And then I'll know, oh, okay, so that's where I need to stop. Mm -hmm. But I would prefer to meet someone who is more like me. So I don't have to go down that road. Right. And then maybe I would fascinate them, you know? That would probably, you know, be interesting <laughs> with someone if you start seeing beings, you know, you're out at Starbucks <laughs> and you're like, I see this being <laughs> over here. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> I'd have to keep, yeah, I know, I know. Oh, I know. Yeah. I just have to, I've learned to, to gauge. I've learned to be able to figure out where people are at. I'll, I can say keywords and I know just by the reaction. Oh, okay. I know where you are. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for me to tell where people are at. Just like one little conversation, a very small conversation. I'll go, okay, I know exactly where you are. And that's where I got to keep myself with you. Have you met any other NDE experiencers? And, and no. you know, hung out with them or been to an IONS meeting or something like that? No. I never met anyone in person, no. Right. I mean, I'm, I've never even had one, and I've never been to one of those meetings, but it would probably be pretty cool to be around a whole bunch of people who've like, experienced something similar that you have. I think it would be. I think it would help a lot. Yeah, I don't think they have one of these where I'm at. I don't, I've never heard of them, so I don't know. Yeah. There's like meetings for people that have NDS. Yeah, I think it's like it's called IANDS, uh, I A N D S, which is like, I believe it's like International Association of Near Death something experiencers or something. And okay. in different cities, I guess there are different chapters, and then people meet up. I think because I've had, I'm pretty sure I've had a couple couple of my guests were from the IANDS in Seattle. And I don't know okay. how far Seattle is from you. Maybe a long ways away. Quite a ways. Uh, I'm pretty sure I had a guest from Manitoba. Are you close to Manitoba? Yeah, I think it's just below the border. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, know. I don't. Yeah, I've never. Maybe that it's an it's a United States thing. Um, I have. Yeah. No, I'm, well, it's inter it's IAN's international, so I'm pretty okay. sure it's worldwide. 
I can check it out. Maybe there's something one of the bigger cities like Calgary or Edmonton or Toronto or Vancouver mm-hmm. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I could, yeah. I could see that Montreal, Toronto, maybe. Vancouver. It would be, it would be a big relief to be around a lot of people that were were similar to me. Oh my god, yeah. It would, I think it would, it would be nice. Yeah. All right, you have a YouTube channel. Do you want to tell yeah. us about it? So it's a brand new YouTube channel. Uh, it's called the Bronze Knight Academy, and I just. I just go over certain things. I'm teaching about energy. I talk about my experiences. It's very new. There's only about four or five videos up. Mm-hmm. The channel is going to take, um, I guess, uh, I'm just going to more involve my my life in general. So it's going to be more vlogging, I think. I'm going to bring people along for the ride of my rise and development and where I'm heading in my future. And along the way, I can share advice from, um, you know, being a drug addict and how I overcame things like that, how I had things like, post-traumatic stress syndrome and depression and anxiety and how just little things that, you know, tips that I've used along the way to, to remove those from my life. And I just want to share some of these things, I'm trying to make like more or less videos of what I would make for my younger self mm-hmm. and how, what I would need back then and what I think would help me. And so it's kind of, yeah, more of like a, maybe a self-help channel right now, but it will alter. And I also do a like a private one-on-one mentorship with people who want to take it further and they have certain blocks or struggles or they want to just maybe have a better life in general. I can always help out with that too. So it's kind of, it all, it all syncs up together, but I'm just doing what I can to um, share what the experience that I had is I, I do believe that a part of my second chance is to give back. A part of it is to help those who are also struggling and I know that my experiences are very unique. So I give a very different perspective on certain things. If people want to reach out to you, do they find you on YouTube? Or are you on Facebook or how should they do that? They can find me on my YouTube channel, but I think the best way, if you want to get to me directly, um, my, my email would be the best way. So um, it's bronze night academy at gmail.com. Okay. And you can re- reach out to me personally, and I, I'm sure I'll get around to uh, responding. Do you have anything else that you're working on right now that you want us to know about? No, I think that's it. That's all I'm up to right now. And um, there's, there will be more, though, for sure. I do have a lot of uh, plans in the works, but um, I'm still at the beginning stages. So I'll let you know, though. All right. Before we finish up here, do you have one last positive message that you'd like to share with everyone? be true, be yourself. Um, I know maybe I'm not the greatest example of that in a sense, but do what you want to do, not what others think you should do. Walk towards a life that you deserve and build yourself a life that you want and take risks and do what it takes to get there. Don't give up. You will, you can, you can make any reality you want real, whatever you can hold in your mind. Um, you can get there as long as you take the steps and the proper actions to get there, you will get there, but just be yourself because there's, there's too much fakery going on too many people that are pretending. And you know what the, the, the weird and the crazy, um, is kind of like the new normal. It's kind of becoming that new cool, right? Um, so I too have to practice more of being fully myself. I just think I'm a little too out there for most people, but I am definitely a a weird one for sure. That's about, I think that's, that's one message I'd have. Well, thank you for that message, Jeff. Yeah. And thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you. I wish you the best and have a great evening. Thank you too, Jeff. All right. Take take care. care. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.